Welcome in. It's the MMQB Podcast YouTube edition with Albert Breer. The divisional round, the best weekend of NFL football all year is in the books. We're looking forward to championship weekend. Two teams will be headed to Super Bowl 52 in Minneapolis, and we'll be all over that. We'll be answering your questions. We'll get to news items here off the top. So let's go get going. Five things I want to hit on. Number one, the New England Patriots coordinators both getting jobs. This is reminiscent of 2004. If you remember back then, the Patriots were going for a third Super Bowl title in four years. And we knew at that point that Charlie Weiss was off to Notre Dame and Romeo Cornell was off to the Cleveland Browns. Same thing this time around. They're going for their third title in four years. We now know Josh McDaniels is off to the Indianapolis Colts. And Matt Patricia is headed for the Detroit Lions. So a couple things here. First, these make sense for very specific reasons. I think for both guys, for both Josh and for Matt, this was going to be about fit. What does that mean? Well, fit in this case means is there a quarterback? And is there synergy with the scouting operation? Okay, and I don't think either of those guys were hung up on making all the decisions, all the personnel decisions for themselves. I think it was a matter of being on board with whoever's there. Okay, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant move by Chris Ballard to build a relationship with Josh McDaniels over the last year. Something that flew under the radar, but it's something that Chris Ballard worked on over the course of the last year, getting to know Josh McDaniels. Seth Wickersham reported in ESPN. Um, if you guys saw the big story a couple of weeks ago, one of the little nuggets in there was that Chris Ballard had called Bill Belichick to try and thaw relations between the two teams that obviously went frozen during deflate gate. And that led to the Jacoby Brissett trade. Well, part of the benefit there for Chris is, you know, finding a way to get Bill's blessing and Josh going to Indianapolis. And so brilliant, brilliant job by Chris Ballard building that relationship that wasn't there previously with Josh McDaniels. And in Detroit, of course, Bob Quinn and Matt Patricia worked together for over a decade. And so those two had a lot of background together. According to those who've been in the building, those two were around each other, one, around one another quite a bit. And so for both Josh McDaniels and Matt Patricia, there is alignment with the scouting operation, which is very, very important. And the second part of it is the quarterback. Okay. Josh McDaniels failed in Denver because. The quarterback situation was a mess. Traded Jay Cutler when he got there, failed to trade for Matt Castle, wound up with Kyle Orton in year one, which he's okay, and then drafted Tim Tebow, and that was curtains for him. So what both Matt and Josh get going into their new situations will be franchise-level quarterbacks. Now, of course, health is a factor with Andrew Luck, but those two guys, both Andrew Luck and Matthew Stafford, both former number one overall picks. Josh will be working directly with Andrew Luck. Matt gets the coaches that Matthew Stafford likes. Presumably he's going to keep offensive coordinator Jim Bob Cooter and quarterbacks coach Brian Callahan. And so you have the ability to hit the ground running because you've got quarterbacks who are still young enough where you can project them out and say, this is going to be my guy for the next decade. But it's also experienced enough where you can step in and win fairly quickly. So, I like the moves for both those guys because the quarterback's in place, because the general managers line up with them. I think the idea that Bill Belichick's coaching tree is such a disaster is completely overblown. Okay? Not saying all those guys won big. They didn't. Clearly they didn't. But a lot of them weren't the train wrecks they were made out to be. Charlie Weiss went to back-to-back BCS Bowl games his first two years at Notre Dame before the wheels fell off. Romeo Cornell won 10 games in 2007. In Cleveland, no one's done that since. And that hadn't been done since Bill Belichick was the coach in Cleveland. Josh McDaniel started 6-0 in Denver before the wheels came off. Eric Mangini built the foundation for the Rex Ryan teams that went to -to back-to-back AFC title games. Now, ultimately, things came apart for those guys. But that's the way it works for most coaches. I looked up a stat this week, and we're going to have as part of Pro Football Now, which we're taping later today. Check that out on SI.com. And there were 37 coaching hires between 2011 and 2015. That's very, very recent. 30 of those coaches are now gone. So these guys just suffered the fate that most coaches suffer. 
And Bill O'Brien, by the way, is now going into his second contract in Houston. Has had winning records three of the first four years. Now looks like he has his quarterback to, to build around. And oh, by the way, Nick Saban's not a bad branch of that tree either. So I like where the Patriots are. I like where the Patriots coordinators are going because of fit. And ultimately, I don't think it's fair to paint these guys with that broader brush. Number two, the job that presumably that the people presume that those two guys wanted that I didn't think either of them really wanted was the Giants job. Okay, and not saying they didn't want it, but I'm not. But but I don't think in the end their number one choice was to go to New York either of them and the reason why isn't because ownership's a problem it's not in new york the maras and the tissues are great owners it's not because of the history of the franchise because the history of the franchise is impeccable it's a absolute brand name flagship franchise for the nfl but there are issues there okay how do you handle eli manning two years left on his contract you know, draft a quarterback second overall, what are you going to get out of him? Would you rather have Josh Rosen or Sam Darnold than Matthew Stafford or Andrew Luck? Probably not right now. I mean, based on like what you know for sure, probably not. Oh, no, by the way, that locker room's a mess. Odell Beckham, Dominique Rogers, Cromarty, Eli Apple, Janoris Jenkins, Eric Flowers. There are problems in that locker room. And so you're going to have to sort all of that out. And now that'll fall to Pat Shermer, who I think was hired because his personality meshes with Dave Gettleman. His personality meshes with the Mares. And the truth is about this job, this was always going to be about someone who fit the Giants, who fit what the Giants have been, who fit what the Giants always have been. I think Pat Shermer fits that. He's level. He's even keel. He's steady. And the benefit here is that Presuming they hang on to Eli Manning, Eli Manning gets his swan song with a quarterbacks guy, and then Shermer will help pick the next one. And obviously, Pat's done bang up work in Minnesota. If you look at the job they've done, going from Teddy Bridgewater to Sam Bradford now to Case Keenum and not missing a beat, all the coaches there, Mike Zimmer included, deserve credit for making it so it almost doesn't. And I'm not saying it doesn't matter who the quarterback is because that's that's not giving credit to Case Keenum for the job that he did that he's done but I'll tell you what those guys a lot of those guys feel like they can win no matter who's back there and that's credit to the coaches number three okay this is another one that Josh was tied to on Monday the Titans fired Mike Malarkey came out of nowhere to some degree because I think well I mean for one thing we saw a week earlier the Titans released a statement that indicated they were planning on hanging on to Malarkey Um, And then on Sunday, Malarkey talked um, to the media as if he knew he was coming back and as if he knew his staff was coming back. Okay, and a lot of people assumed on Monday morning when this happened, oh, well, they're watching Josh McDaniel slip away to Indianapolis, and so they're pulling the plug quickly so they can get in in on that race. That was not it at all. In fact, I don't even know that Josh would have really been the lead dog there. And I love Josh as a coach, but I I, I don't necessarily think he would have been the lead dog for the Titans job. I think this is as much as anything else about the way the last two weeks transpired and the relationship between the GM, John Robinson, and the coach, Mike Malarkey, which was very, very good a few weeks ago. But when news started to trickle out at the end of the regular season and the rumor mill started to spin on Malarkey's job security, and you heard it again during Wild Card Weekend, that fractured the trust. And Mike Malarkey felt like a lot of that stuff was coming from the front office. And so now he doesn't trust the front office. Then you turn around and you see him expressing that in not so many words publicly. And so then the front office doesn't like that he did that, that he's throwing players under the bus, that he's um, that he's publicly airing his grievances with the organization. That's what this is about. And so when they're looking at doing an extension, it's only a Band-Aid extension. When they're looking at the conditions he'll come back on, they're talking about staff changes because they're worried about Marcus Mariota's development. And so a lot of the trust issues 
and the discord over the last few weeks affected their ability to do something that would prevent Mike Malarkey from going into a lame duck year in 2018. And it crystallized that the fit just was no longer there. And that's what this is about. And so, again, we talked about fit with the Patriots coordinators. Look for fit here with John Robinson. Look for personality fit. Look at the type of team he's built and what he'll be looking for. Remember, this is a guy who, in his first draft, moved around the board and wound up taking a right tackle, Jack Conklin, with his first pick, invested in backup offensive linemen in his first offseason, traded for DeMarco Murray, and drafted Derrick Henry in the second round. He wants a big physical team. He wants a bully. And I think that Mike Vrabel, the Texans linebackers coach, has the inside track right now. Now, I think there's going to be an open process, and I think that Robinson's going to be deliberate. But I think that Vrabel can go and get this job so long as he can convince ownership in Tennessee and Robinson himself that he's got a good plan to develop Mariota and develop the right kind of offense for the quarterback. Because remember, this has been the way the owners in Tennessee has operated over the course of the last three years. Everything's been about Mariota. When Mariota and Zach Mettenberger got the crap knocked out of him, them in the beginning of 2015, Ken Wisenhunt got fired for it. When they found a way to fix that problem down the stretch of 2015, Mike Malarkey got the job because of it. And part of the selling point on Robinson was that he'd been around Brady and he'd seen how the Patriots had built the right environment for Brady, and he was part of drafting Jameis Winston in Tampa. So a lot of those things have been about the the quarterback. Where Where you'd make the mistake here is if you assume they need an offensive guy or they need a quarterback's guy to be their head coach. They need that in their building, but it doesn't need to come from the head coach. I think from a personality and a program standpoint, Vrabel will really fit what Robinson wants. He's just going to have to find a way to take care of the other stuff, take care of – how do I build? How are we going to build an offense? What's the offense going to look like? How's it going to fit Mariota? And how ultimately are we going to develop Mariota? He's got to have a detailed plan for that. But if he has that, I think he's got the inside track for the job. All right, number four, the Jaguars have talked a lot of shit. They've talked a lot of shit. In fact, Jalen Ramsey and the crew, I think, I think, well, went straight from the airport to the stadium to talk that shit. And so there was Jalen Ramsey saying, we're going to the Super Bowl even though we're going to our first AFC championship game and we're playing against a quarterback and a coach who are playing in their 12th AFC title game together. We're going to the Super Bowl even though we've got to defeat the defending Super Bowl champions on their turf to do it. And I sort of like it. I think this is a big part of who the Jaguars are. And I think... It's part of what you're going to need to be to go in there and win. You need to not care. Like, you need to not be worried about all the external stuff. And there's a swagger to the Jaguars team that I think is not unlike the Jets teams that went in there and won, the Ravens teams that went in there and won in the playoffs, where they were defense-driven teams, and they just had this swagger about them. Now, I'm not saying they're going to win because I don't – I'm picking the Patriots. But it feels to me like what you saw in that stadium was a little bit of what we've seen from teams that have defeated the Patriots in the past that have been able to go in there and not care about the weather, not care about the environment, not tighten up when they see that number 12 and that hoodie on the other sideline. And so I think the Jags, I I, I like how loose they look and how – Free, it seems like they're playing. I still don't know if they can win. They've got the type of defense that typically beats the Patriots in the playoffs. You need to be able to get to Brady. With, you need to be able to get to Brady with four to beat New England in the playoffs. They can do that. You need to have athletes to cover the backs and tight ends. They do have that. I just think in the end, being able to hold Brady down. For long enough to, I mean, to be able to to be able to keep him in check the whole game is a lot to ask. I think eventually the dam's gonna break. I don't like the matchup of Blake Bortles versus Bill Belichick and Matt Patricia. That's a big part of what it boils down to. All right, number five. Before we get to your questions, and we are gonna get to your questions here in a second. I'm gonna give you a couple things that the title games told us. 
Okay. One defense is still important. Everybody's staring at the names of the quarterbacks. Everybody's obsessed with those names, right? Blake Bortles, Nick Foles, Case Keenum, and of course, Tom Brady. You're looking at the wrong thing. Okay. You're looking at the absolute wrong thing. What you should be looking at is the defense rankings. Okay. The number one team in the NFL in total defense this year was the Minnesota Vikings. The number two team in total defense in the NFL this year was the Jacksonville Jaguars. The number four team in the NFL in total defense this year was the Philadelphia Eagles. Additionally, the number one team in the NFL in scoring defense was the Minnesota Vikings. The number one, number two team in scoring defense was the Jacksonville Jaguars. The number four team in scoring defense was the Philadelphia Eagles. The number five team in scoring defense was the New England Patriots. So you have three of the top four in total defense, four of the top five in, to- in scoring defense. The playoffs aren't about being able to do one thing really well. It's about being able to do everything. Because eventually you're going to run into a team that's going to be able to take advantage of what you don't do well or take away what you do do well and force you to play left-handed. That's what the Patriots have been for 20 years. And you better be able to play left-handed. That's why last week it was so important that Blake Bortles could be competent. And he was. He was 6 for 11 for 88 yards on third down. He converted another third down on a 16-yard run. Like the Steelers eventually got a beat on Leonard Fournette, said, okay, like now we're going to make you beat us with Blake. And they did. And the, the, the Jaguars were a, the Jaguars were able to get enough plays out of Blake Bortles. And so defense still really matters. Number two, quarterbacking is at least in part about environment. What do these teams have in common? All four of them invested in offensive linemen, right? Minnesota paid a zillion bucks to fix their tackle position in the offseason. Now I know Remmers is playing guard now, but they paid a zillion bucks to get Reef and Remmers to settle the problem they had last year. Jacksonville spent the 34th overall pick on Cam Robinson, who was in place to play left tackle when the guy they traded for, Brandon Albert, retired. They also paid their center, Brandon Linder. The Eagles have spent a ton of resources on offensive linemen. They paid their left tackle for the third time. Jason Peters, now he's hurt, but they've got a draft pick behind him for depth. Big V was a fifth round pick when they didn't really need didn't really need have a needed tackle, but they invested to have depth there. They paid the they drafted the right tackle, Lane Johnson, fourth overall, and paid him. They paid their center, Jason Kelsey. They went out in the free agent market and got their guard, Brandon Brooks. The New England Patriots have spent nine draft picks over the last four years on offensive linemen. They paid their left tackle. They paid their right tackle, who is now hurt, Marcus Cannon twice. They paid their center, David Andrews. See, all these teams have built offensive linemen, have built offensive lines that help prop up their quarterback. They've built running games that help prop up their quarterback. All four of these teams are capable of running the ball. All four of these teams play good defense. And so, you know, I think big, a big part of what we're seeing now is how important everything around the quarterback is. And finally, before we get to your questions, coaching is still really important. Okay. Mike Zimmer's done a fantastic job with the Vikings. And to be able to win with all the different quarterbacks that they have over the last three years is incredibly impressive. The Jacksonville Jaguars, you have to give Doug Marone credit for building an identity there. And you know what? When Mike Tomlin and his staff messed everything up on Sunday and those calls on those fourth downs, the Jags were there to pick up the pieces. The Eagles, what a stacked staff. I mean, Doug Peterson to bring in Jim Schwartz to be his defensive coordinator and then have two layers of coordinators, in essence, on the offensive side of the ball and Frank Reich and John Filippo. Just a loaded staff. And, of course, I don't even need to talk about the Patriots and what they have on their coaching staff. So we're going to get to your questions now. Looking forward to championship weekend. Patriots and the Jaguars, the Eagles, and the Vikings. And I'm open to answering all your questions on the coaching search. We will go for probably about, what, five, ten minutes? Let's go for five, ten minutes. Okay, best head coaching candidate to progress, Marcus Mariota. I would say the top guy out there right now might be John D. Filippo. 
Um, if you're looking at a head coach just strictly to develop Mariota and the guy who might be the top offensive mind that's available, Matt LaFleur is going to interview there on Thursday, and he's Sean McVay's offensive coordinator. You'd be projecting with him a little bit because he isn't calling plays in Los Angeles, but the history of those that, that stat of guys from that tree now is getting pretty good. You got McVay in LA and we've seen what Kyle Shanahan was able to do at the end of the season in San Francisco. We also see how Atlanta missed Kyle Shanahan. So Matt LaFleur coming from that tree, you would think that it would help the quarterback. Can the Pats offensive line handle Saxonville? I think the big problem is going to be Calais Campbell. The interior of the offensive line's got pushed around some, so he's the guy that I would watch. Any chance the Colts move on from Luck and Josh works with Brissett, or did Jacoby not show much? I don't think Jacoby Brissett's the long-term answer quarterback. My feeling is they're optimistic about about Andrew Luck's health now. Now they got to see him in the throwing program, which is supposed to start this month. He got back in the building in December. What I can tell you, you can I, I wrote this on the MMQB this morning. Um, he has put on weight he's back he's back where he was before he got injured from a weight standpoint so he looks good now they just got to see him go through the program I don't think there are any promises here because they've obviously had so many setbacks but I think things look decent now and worse comes to worse they could they could spend the third overall pick on a quarterback when is Johnny Manziel going to sign with the Hamilton Tiger Cats I do not know implications of Foster's arrest in Alabama I was actually surprised that there's anywhere in America that still hauls people to jail for smoking weed so I don't think the, uh, the implications of that arrest are going to be that serious can the Eagles block flip from leaving no flips contract is up the swag wars is that a reference to them moving to London I don't know Dion Lewis follow McDaniels to Indianapolis not impossible I would look for both Patricia and McDaniels to be taking guys with them to be kind of tent to be kind of tone setters for their programs, their new programs in Indianapolis and Detroit, who is the best receiver for this year's draft. I would keep an eye on Cortland Sutton from SMU. The stock answer for a lot of people right now is going to be Alabama's Calvin Ridley, and he's a very good player. But Cortland Sutton's six foot five, two 230 pounds, just an absolute monster. And he's somebody who's probably going to light up the combine. Who is the favorite in Arizona? I've gotten this question a bunch. I think Steve Wilkes is still in the running there, as is John Filippo. Wilkes, of course, was selling Filippo as his potential offensive coordinator, so it's possible we have a combination of those two in Arizona. Mike Munchak's another name who's been in the mix. Brian Flores is another name who's been in the mix. Who do you think the Ravens will draft um, and or maybe position? Receiver's obviously one that I think you'd be looking at. I remember when I did my last mock, we – we mocked uh, Calvin Ridley to them. Chance Reich will leave, and Doug promotes Flip to OC. I think at this point it might take making him the offensive coordinator to keep him. His contract is up. And so, look, Flip's very, very well thought of. The problem is, if you're Philly right now, if you were going to get rid of Reich and you were going to promote Flip, he's well thought of enough where he, there's a good chance that he gets a head coaching job in 2019. And so if you sign up for another year of Flip, which – from a 2018 standpoint, would make all the sense in the world. You're looking at the possibility maybe of losing him after 2018 if Carson Wentz has another great year, and then you're back to square one. You don't have either of them. How good is this year's wide receiver class? It's certainly not 2014, um, but there are some good players there. Cortland Sutton, again, is one. Calvin Ridley from Alabama is another. Memphis has got a kid. There are some good players. It's not great. Um, Anthony Miller, I believe, is a Memphis kid. Yeah. Any staff names for McDaniels? Matt Eberflus is going to be the defensive coordinator from the Dallas Cowboys. Salary cap increasing next season. Yes, I, I know it's going to be up around 178. I, th I think that's like an 11 million dollar increase, right? Over under how many years Bill Belichick is le has left coaching? Let's let's stick that at one and a half. Uh, with Bortles playing well, where does Eli go this off season? I don't think Eli gets traded. I think Pat Shermer works with Eli. And obviously we've still got a lot to learn on that. And we gotta figure out and I gotta figure out what Pat's gonna what, what Pat's thinking on Eli, but I think it makes some sense for the Giants to hold on to Eli Manning. He's only gonna cost him sixteen and a half million dollars a year over the next two years. And you can bring him back if you can get him to agree to this and be sort of the placeholder as you get the second overall pick ready to play. Just a thought. Do the Browns and Giants take quarterbacks top two? As of right now, I would say I would answer that question yes. 
Kirk Cousins ends, ends up where. There will be suitors for Kirk Cousins. The Browns will be one. The Jets will be another. The Broncos will be another. Perhaps the Jacksonville Jaguars. Thoughts on the terrible job the referees did the last few games. This is good. I actually asked Will, my producer here, if I should do the refs. Um, and we discussed it, and we just couldn't find something to take out of the five news topics, but I do want to get to the referees. I thought they were awful over the weekend. That game, it, it, it absolutely – look, the, I don't think the Titans were winning the game in Foxborough, period, but it certainly took any hope away from them. The call on Decker, the offsides calls. I mean, there were just little things that I think we saw over the course of the weekend that – really make you question what you're watching again. But I think worse than anything else is how long these reviews are taking. It's totally screwing up the flow of the game. And here's the thing, guys, and I know I'm going to keep answering your questions, so keep asking, but I, the, here's the thing. like The way I look at it, if you're going to centralize replay, if you're going to put replay in New York, why aren't you using it to expedite these calls? If there's an obvious one, why can't Al Riveron just get in the ear of Ed Hockley on the field and say, you know what, don't even bother going over under the hood. That's obvious. It's a catch or it's not a catch. Whatever it is, just get that word down to them quickly. Some of these can be solved in 30 seconds. Instead, every single time, and maybe this is about sponsorship with Microsoft or whatever, that they need to send people over there. I'm, I think it's always about things like that. But just use the, use the central command to expedite the replay process totally easy makes sense that's why you should that's why you should centralize replay you shouldn't be centralizing it so you can turn every single freaking call into a federal investigation just take the calls that are obvious buzz down from new york and say hey look that one's easy you don't need to go under the under the hood just Turn on your mic, announce it to the crowd, and let's move on to the next play. Should the Vikes be concerned about their offensive coordinator? They have a very good, a very well-regarded quarterbacks coach on staff. I'll be interested to see if Kevin Stefanski, who's been the running backs coach, who has moved over to be quarterbacks coach, if he gets a shot at being the offensive coordinator now. It's a very, very, it's an interesting name. Five for 25 for Jimmy. I think Jimmy G could wind up getting more than that. Will Steelers owners get tired of Tomlin's poor time management? <sighs> You know, one of the things that's tough here is that you get the game management issues with Tomlin, and I think you've got to start to try to figure out, can we solve this with his staff? Because obviously he's got the problems there. I think Tomlin in a lot of ways is much like Bill Cowher, um, who was there, of course, for 14 years, and now Tomlin will be going into his 12th year as Steelers coach. What Tomlin does well is he manages personalities. He leads a program. That's what his strength is. That's one of the reasons why they've been able to take risks on players in the past. That's why they can manage to have a Le'Veon Bell and an Antonio Brown and a Martavius Bryant all in the same locker room. That's why they can do that, because they've got coaches who are capable of leading programs and managing personalities. Now, if you want to have that and you're giving up the other part of it, I think you can try to make up for it in other places on your staff. And certainly I think that's something they need to look at. Do you see Roquan as an option for the Niners? I mean, I don't know if it'd be redundant with, first of all, I think it would probably, well, they're right in the range now. I think they're right at 10, somewhere around there now. So yeah, that, that'd be right. Nine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, Will says nine. That would be an interesting one just because that's right around the range where I think Roquan Smith will go. Um, it also would probably free you up to use Ruben Foster a little differently. That'd be an interesting one. I sort of like that. Who's covering Gronkowski this Sunday? I am actually trying to figure that out now. I've texted a few people. I'll let you guys know what comes back on that one. Um, my guess would be, like, look, I think that there's a ch chance they use Jalen Ramsey on Gronkowski, which I think would be really, really interesting. Let's do five more questions, then I'm going to get out of here right at a half hour. I appreciate you guys coming out. My picks for this weekend, I think it's going to be a New England Vikings, a New England Minnesota Super Bowl. Number two, will the Jets trade ahead of Denver for a quarterback? I think the Jets are going to look at everything at quarterback, and there's a good chance that they make a very spirited run at Kirk Cousins. We'll see, because I think these quarterbacks are going to be graded differently. And I'm talking the top four guys by different teams. Baker Mayfield, Josh Allen, Josh Rosen, Sam Darnold. I'm just telling you, I think Rosen and Darnold, they've got a good shot to go 1-2, but there are going to be teams that like Allen more than anyone else, and there are going to be teams that like Mayfield more than anyone else. Number three, who are Patricia's coordinators in Detroit? I'm still trying to figure out who his def defensive coordinator is going to be. That's less relevant, of course, because he coaches on that side of the ball. But his offensive coordinator 
will likely be Jim Bob Cooter. His quarterback's coach will likely be Brian Callahan. Number four is Miami in the free agent draft quarterback market. I certainly don't think that they would use a first-round pick on a quarterback, but after that, maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, they're out of the guaranteed money for Ryan Tannehill now, and he turns 30 this summer. And so they've got more flexibility than they've had in years at quarterback. And so it'll be interesting to see the way everything goes down there. I don't think they bring back Jay Cutler, but could I see them drafting a developmental guy? I certainly could see that. Number five, Niners tag or get a long-term deal done with Jimmy. Let's finish it up there. I said um, somebody asked me there, is, do you expect Jimmy Garoppolo to get Carr's deal? Five for 125. I'm here to tell you right now that would be a hometown discount. That would be less than I think he's capable of getting. They're going to have to put the exclusive franchise tag on him. Chances are the exclusive franchise tag is going to be around $26 million. They don't calculate that until April, but it's the average of the top five cap numbers at his position. That will likely be somewhere in the range of $26 million. And so here's what you want to do. You want to add two tags together, okay? That and, 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 that, and then you divide by two, and that gives you your average, what the average per year usually is. So let's say it's 26. Okay, so 26, 120% of 26 would be 31.2. Okay, so now we're talking about at, like what's right in the middle of those two numbers, 26 and 31.2. I don't know what my math, what, 28.6, 28.6? So you're talking about somewhere in the 28 to $29 million range is his leverage point. So that, five, that 125 over 5 number, remember Derek Carr did that with a year left on his deal. And so we were talking about swallowing a year in his deal. The Raiders were assuming a year of his injury risk. And so that's one of the reasons why that deal got done at that number. If Garoppolo decides I'm going to maximize my earning power here, I played, I, I went through a lot to get here. I had to sit for three and a half years. You know, I, I played out to the end of my contract. If Garoppolo wants to, he could really hold them over a barrel here as former Niners president, Carmen Paulus. He's so graphically described just about a week ago. All right. I appreciate you guys coming out. I always want your feedback. So you can give me my, you can give me your feedback on Twitter at Albert Breer on my Facebook page at Albert R. Breer. You guys can send me messages there. I can give you answers here. We're going to keep rolling with this. I not sure the way we're going to work it next week. Cause I'm going to be in Mobile, Alabama. We're going to figure out a way to get that done for you. Then the week after that, the Super Bowl. again, all your feedback is absolutely appreciated help make us better and always remember to listen to the mmqb 10 things podcast the mmqb podcast with peter king and one more time this podcast the mmqb podcast with albert breer both this edition the youtube edition and our traditional old school edition which pops with andy gresham lou pellegrino on friday mornings you can get us at spotify tune in stitcher google play apple Podcasts, wherever you guys get your podcasts Next week, we'll be from Mobile, probably looking back at the championship games and looking forward to Super Bowl week. I'll see you guys then.